Well, I'm not sure I even remember how to do this, but this is Ask Paul Kirtley, episode 81. Welcome, welcome to Ask Paul Kirtley. It's great to be back again. And I have to say, I won't waffle on about this for too long, but I really must mention how grateful I am to the absolutely fantastic positive response that I received to my recent video asking whether or not you'd like to see this series back again. And also if you had any questions. Um, there's a lot of questions there. Some of them have been discussed before. Um, I would recommend searching through the Ask Paul Kirtley's. I will look at some sort of indexing of questions, um, certainly uh, going back as well so that people can easily find those answers that I've already given um, answers to for those questions. Um, but there's a bunch of new questions there as well or different angles on things that maybe we haven't discussed before. And there is certainly um, scope for continuing this series. And I certainly feel very positive about doing this again. And I also intend to do more practical videos on my YouTube channel as well. I know some of you listen to these as podcasts. And just so that it's absolutely clear right from the start again, some people have been asking, oh, do something practical, do practical stuff and ask Paul Kirtley's. I'm sorry, please listen to what I have to say. I'm not going to go quite into a rant yet, but please listen. This goes out as an audio podcast, which means that people listen to it and they can't see me, which means that I can't do practical things, otherwise they can't see it. The primary way that a lot of people listen to this is through their audio systems and not through YouTube or my blog. So I want to be fair to everyone. This will remain a question and answer session. Appreciate all the suggestions and some of those may feed into other things on my YouTube channel, but this is a question and answer session where I verbally answer questions. And to go right back to the beginning, the reason that Ask Paul Kirtley started in the first place was that I could not deal with all the questions that I received via my blog, blog um, in terms of answering people individually because I often get the same questions multiple times. And also I felt that I should, if I was spending a good amount of time answering a question for one person, if that was gonna be useful for other people, then I should put it out in public as well as uh, if people were happy for that question to be answered in public. So that's why Ask Paul Kirtley is here. So the format stays the same, it's question and answer. Some of you have said, make it a bit shorter. Some of you have said, keep it long. Um, that is, there, there is no consensus there. Um, I appreciate the fact that it might be easier to find answers to particular questions if they are um, answered individually. So like each episode is one question. And there's some validity to that, particularly in the context of YouTube um, and particularly in the context of search for Google. But well, the problem that I then have is that um, I've got to produce a web page and an upload and an audio version and upload that to the um, podcasting host and link it all together for every single question, which basically quintuples, if I normally do five questions per session, it quintuples the amount of work I've got to do on behind the scenes stuff. A lot of people think I have a big team of people helping me on websites and stuff. I don't, it's me. I do everything myself. And maybe there's some stupidity in that, but um, it's just the way that it's, it's evolved. Um, I don't have the funds to, I don't have the financial funds to pay a team of people to run on my social media and do YouTube um, videos and uploads and manage websites and stuff for me. The only person I have helping me is Amanda, my partner, and she does the customer service on Frontier Bushcraft. So um, if you send an email to Frontier Bushcraft, any questions about courses, initially it's Amanda who gets those and she deals with those because I'm traveling a lot, I'm teaching a lot, and so there's that point of contact. But other than that, it's me that does all of this stuff. So I have to think about what's practical. And a lot of you have said, if you do bring Ask Paul Kirtley back, 
please make it something that you continue to do. Don't sort of dangle the carrot, do a few and then um, not do any more. So I have to think about how I can consistently do these, which means that I have to make it um, straightforward to process the, um, the sessions. What I should be doing, of course, where I add the most value to you is by answering your questions, not by dicking around with websites and chopping audio from videos into multiple pieces or compiling audio from multiple videos into one podcast, which is the other option. That would be doable. I might go down that route. I'm still thinking about it. I could do a question per episode on video and then do like an omnibus edition. The problem there though is that it might be Ask Paul Kirtley episode 85 on YouTube, but what then does it become on an audio if I've just put 81, 82, 84 and 85 into one podcast? What do I call that on, um, on the podcast? So frankly, um, that's all too hard for me at the moment to try and do it any differently to how I did it before. Um, what I think I will do though is keep the number of questions maybe a little bit lower per episode, um, sort of hit the middle ground, do two or three, maybe four, depending on how long they take to answer, and then get them out more regularly than if I saved them up and then have a, have a chunk. Um, see how it goes, eh? But anyway, thank you for your positive response uh, to doing these. I'm just gonna grab my phone. Um, I actually don't have any phone reception here. Again, um, on that point, quite a number of people said, well, why don't you just do them as live streams? Well, because a lot of the places I go, um, even for work, you know, just regular work, never mind running expeditions and trips when I might have time to record one of these, there's no phone reception. Um, and that's before you get into the issues of, of charging phones and all of that kind of stuff, you know, keep it, you know, a, a live stream requires quite a lot of connectivity and it also runs the battery down quite a bit, it seems. So um, if I'm away from an electricity supply and I know you can get charging banks and whatnot, but it, it's just too difficult. I could do live streams from my office, but then People criticise me for doing outdoor Q. I mean, I've had criticisms in the past about people, uh, you know, from people saying, oh, you're doing an outdoor Q&A in your library, in your office or in your spare bedroom or whatever they think it is. Um, so you can't win, you know, you know what YouTube's like, but um, frankly, uh, I have no issue with the technology of doing live streams. I think it's a great idea. And I've done a number of things, um, over the course of lockdown in 2020, um, where I've done Q and A's, I've done live streams with people, and they work well as long as you've got good connectivity and you've got a good electricity supply. But one of the things about this that made it work really well in the past was that as I was traveling, as I was you know working in different places, I could you know on a day off, for example, when I'm out for a hike, or even when I'm on vacation, I can have a fantastic backdrop i can stop during a hike you know we did one from patagonia we've done them from you know canoe trips in canada there's no phone reception in those places but i can still record something with the camera that i've got with me even a little compact camera and then i can upload it when i get home and it's a bit more of an interest uh, for you rather than me just sitting in the same place where i've got good phone reception every time that i do it um and also i think um unless you've got somebody to help you read and filter the questions, doing a live stream is very difficult in terms of reading good questions and answering them. I know I did a, um, on the final part of my Barron's trip, I did a, um, a premiere of that and that was fantastic. That was a great experience. It's the first premiere that I've done. And I've got some old footage of a blood vein trip as well that I'm going to turn into a movie um, and I will premiere that on YouTube as well. And it's great sitting down and watching it with all of you for the first time and answering questions. It's great, but it's also really demanding, um, you know, just keeping track of all of the comments coming through. It's actually really hard work. And then having to formulate answers to that um, and answer them. I'm inevitably gonna miss some of the comments as I'm answering. So it's pretty tricky to do that unless I've got somebody helping me to, to filter those and put those questions in front of me. So frankly, I think um, it's a, you know, I could just, 
ignore those questions and those suggestions, but I think it's worth me mentioning them at the beginning of this series, um, or this second run of this series, if you like, um, so that I, you know that I haven't not considered them. Um, I have considered those suggestions, you know, live streaming, chopping things up into different uh, smaller chunks, um, doing more practical stuff. Yeah, and, and, and there are merits in all of those things, but frankly, I've got to try and fit this in between other things and do it in a way that I can continue to serve you as long as we all decide that this is worthwhile for me to do. Um, and so I think the simplest thing for me to do is continue to record them as and when I can. Um, I can edit them, I can put that nice you know, music at the beginning and the end and stuff that everyone seems to enjoy. And I can put them out as an audio podcast as well as a video. It can all come out at the same time. Um, and everyone is served really well by that. And I think if I just try and keep the, the, the length um, down in terms of uh, number of questions as well as total amount of time, then it will suit everyone. That being said, I know I've just talked for you know, 10, 15 minutes, but I think this is the first one. There's, at the time, at the last time I looked, there was 700 and odd comments on that video. Um, and I just want to thank you and give credit to all of you for um, your positive response and just wanting this to come back and all of your great suggestions. And I want you to feel like I've taken those into consideration, which has given me some ideas for other things. Um, and that's super useful. And so um, let's jump into the questions. Um, this is quite a, a topical one at the time of recording. Um, let me just, I just, I've just done screenshots of these from YouTube. Um, I will talk more about different ways of asking me questions going forwards, but for the time being, there's a ton of questions there on that YouTube uh, video that I put out recently, and I'll continue to answer some of those. What I've done here is I've just chosen some that caught my eye initially um, to answer, and I know there's a bunch more there um, that are good questions as well. So this is um, Steve, Dave, not Craig, and there are um, a number of different things here, but one of them is about COVID-19. And of course this year, 2020, has been the year of, of COVID and all the lockdowns and whatnot. Um, but one of the great things about uh, your feedback recently has, has been that people have really found both the Aspor Kirtleys that I'd recorded, you know, between five years ago and a couple of years ago, um, very, very helpful and useful during lockdown. A lot of people just discovered them for the first time. Other people have been through them a second time um, or even a third time in some cases. And it's just starting to rain. I'm going to chuck my jacket on. Um, and that's fantastic. And I think a lot of people have found that very, very helpful to have some connection with the outdoors in that way while maybe they haven't been able to do the things that they wanted to do, make the journeys they wanted to do. Just move my microphone there. Yeah, so I think that's been, I'm really glad that that's been useful to people and, and provided some sort of solace and help to people during the, the period, not to sort of blow smoke up my own ass at all. That's not what I'm trying to say, but I, I've been bowled over by how some people, how some people have found it so important to, to listen to those things over the course of uh, 2020, even though I recorded them, you know, quite a few years ago, some of them. And then also the Paul Kirtley podcast as well. So um, just in that context, you know, you might be watching this or listening to this episode in, in years to come and maybe not quite appreciate that. So I think that's, I think that's important uh, to, to recognize that these things have been useful and I'm glad. And I, and I apologize for not really putting much out over this period. It's been a real sort of tumultuous time of turmoil. And this, and this sort of speaks to this question from, uh, from, from this person here. I'm gonna call him Steve because it says Steve, Dave, not Craig. I will call you Steve. So Steve says, yes, if you want to bring back some aspect or level of Aspor Kirtley, I will most definitely be watching. Though I only started watching them at the start of the lockdown and only got about 60 or 70% backwards through the episodes before deciding to take up your tree and plant ID course, which now dominates my PK exposure. Though I wouldn't want you to feel 
uh, you uh, you have to or depressed about making them um, or more of them I very much appreciate it is something you do for free for the community I'll also admit I was one of the ones that would note down many of your suggestions and recommendations and so there's a number of questions here from Steve first one um, topical how have you seen the lockdown or COVID-19 affecting bushcraft bushcraft community businesses positives and or negatives um, it's very difficult for me to speak to the industry i can't speak to what's been going on in the industry as such and you know some people out there be like you know is it even an industry i think there is an instruction there's a small instructional industry that's part of a wider community of um, outdoors instructors both in the uk as well as more globally and we saw that the global bushcraft symposium there's some very talented and knowledgeable people there who are part of the bushcraft and survival world and you know will include primitive technology and traditional you know living skills in all of that and encompass all of that um, and it's hard to say how it's affected everyone um, and I think it depends on what territory you're in but uh, you know speaking for myself and uh, as a business owner and someone who teaches uh, bushcraft in courses in person as well as running um, trips and expeditions um, I, I've noticed a couple of things first off there were a number of months when we just couldn't run any courses uh, due to the lockdown restrictions um, also initially even before the lockdown came in when we had people panic buying food or it was expressed as panic buying in the media um, even though if you've got a government that says be prepared to spend two weeks at home when most people don't buy two weeks worth of food in one go you're going to have people buying more food in one go you know it doesn't take a genius to work that out you know so all of a sudden you've got people going to the shops buying more than normal because the government is saying please be prepared to self-isolate okay go figure um, and then of course you've got the media saying there's no toilet rolls left on the shelves then you've got people running around trying to find those things and maybe buying more than they would normally buy because they're frightened of running out of things so you've got this um, vicious circle vicious cycle which happens which was fueled by the media as well but I don't think it was unreasonable for people to be buying more food than normal um, because the government said be prepared to stay at home and not go out for a few weeks um, but that happened and so we were concerned even before lockdown started that we would be able to feed people on courses because getting getting hold of the food that we needed fresh food in particular or even simple things like alcohol hand gel for the normal regular in-camp hygiene practices that we always practice um, as well as toilet rolls and things that was starting to become something of an issue but that all then became academic because we then weren't allowed to run any courses because we were being asked to all stay at home and so we played the game and through from late March when the, the lockdown started in the UK um, right up until towards the end of July we didn't run any of the courses or trips that we had scheduled so we had to cancel a trip to Canada and we also cancelled a bunch of courses or at least we postponed them so we put extra dates on for 2021 as well as our regular 2021 dates which has been something of a struggle to make sure that we can definitely get the staff availability um, but we've managed to schedule um, all the courses we need to for next year unfortunately it means that some of them are already full and um, because we've had to move 2020 people to 20 2021 which means ultimately that if we haven't managed to increase the capacity of all the courses some of them we haven't been able to for a number of reasons it's just people's diaries you know particularly when I'm working with Ray Goodwin for example also venue availability or just you know absolute amount of time that's available for anyone and um, it means that we're going to take a dip in revenue because over the course of 2020 and 2021 we're not going to run as many courses as we would have done because we've shifted a lot of the 2020 courses into 2021 so and I think that's the case for quite a number of people that you know either their courses weren't already full this year and they couldn't fill them because people stopped doing things and they weren't allowed to run the courses they couldn't run the courses or they've moved a lot of their customers uh, their students to programs next year or even beyond and that means ultimately that unless those businesses make up for that at some point they're still going to lose money 
And then of course, like any business, and we've seen this across the board, um, you've still got overheads, um, you've still got insurance to pay, you've maybe still got vehicles, vehicle tax to pay, um, vehicle servicing, you've got maybe uh, equipment in a, in a storage um, facility, you know, you're paying for things, you've got websites to maintain, all of that stuff costs money. And if you don't have any revenue coming in, you don't have any course fees coming in, that's a problem um, over time. And that has certainly been the case, I think, in the UK. And I suspect it's also been the case in the United States. And I know it's also been the case to an extent in Australia. I don't know about other parts of the world, but I suspect it's a pretty similar story in, in most places where um, there's, you know, we've kicked the problem down the road somewhat but it's still going to be an issue. And I think it's going to be the same for a lot of businesses. Yes, there has been some government help for self-employed people. There's been some relief um, in terms of some allowances from central government in terms of some of the taxation policy. But overall, my view is that it's hit the outdoor industry. I'm not just talking about bushcraft, but I'm also just talking about you know, outdoor centers, whether they're catering to kids from schools, whether they're catering to adults, whether they're catering to professionals, getting qualifications. Um, they've, all they've all suffered. And then you've got the freelance instructors who work for those places, for those outfits, who are not getting the work. They're not running expeditions for kids. They're not running expeditions for adults. They're not teaching mountain leader syllabuses. They're not teaching single pitch award. They're not teaching um, all of those things that they'd normally be doing. I think it's, it's caused a big drop in income for individuals within the industry. I hope that they've managed to, to claw some of that back with some of the um, relief that has been available for self-employed people. Um, but I also know some people have gone out of business. I also know that some people are struggling. I also know that some people have um, been made unemployed. Um, I know that some, some centres have been mothballed. Um, so yeah, it's been a tough, it's been a tough time. All the while, I think more people have been outdoors, um, which comes on to one of the other questions that we'll answer in a minute. Um, you know, you've had an increase in people looking to do things closer to home. People haven't been able to travel. People haven't been able to go on adventurous holidays further afield, which means they've been looking to do things closer to home. Um, we recently did some river spay trips. We were able to, to run our river spay trips um, this year. It just happened to fall in between all of the, the lockdown periods. We just had a window there where we had them scheduled and we happened to be able to run them. We had extra um, things in place in terms of social distancing, um, huge amount of alcohol hand gel used, um, antibacterial washing up, uh, you know, lots of separation of people, um, face masks in vehicles, in shuttles, all those sorts of things that, that we've done to try and minimise the risk of any cross-contamination. Um, but we, we ran the spay trips, but I saw more people on the River Spay this year than I've ever seen before in running spay trips for the best part of a decade. Um, equally, even in towns, you know, you're seeing people on stand-up paddle boards and inflatable kayaks on canals and, you know, in places that you wouldn't normally see them. And so I think there has been a huge increase in people wanting to do things outdoors, but equally the, the providers of, in, you know, guided in, uh, and instruction, guided trips and instruction haven't necessarily been able to do some of the things that they'd normally do. So hopefully it feeds through to a greater interest in doing things with providers providers going forwards and, and that might actually benefit the industry but I think it's a bit too early to see um, at this stage. Um, and then I think you've got more people consuming content online. I've certainly seen an uptick in um, my YouTube views for example and I know speaking to, to other people who have reasonable size, reasonably sizable YouTube channels that they've also seen an uptick in views. Um, and you'd normally expect a downtick in views over the summer and an uptick in views over the winter. Um, but we've seen an uptick in views in a lot of places um, over the summer this year. And that that's, you know, stands to reason, doesn't it? People have been indoors more, they've been in lockdown, they haven't been able to go out and do as many things as normally. Um, and so they've been resorting to, to consuming relevant content on, online. Um, I think the flip side of that, though, is that maybe there, hasn't been, uh, there haven't been as many advertisers willing to, to put money into things like YouTube. And I think you've also had maybe some of the outdoor equipment manufacturers struggling, partly because um, 
the, some of the retail outlets have been closed and partly because some of their manufacturing operations are quite small which means that it's hard for them to keep their workers socially distanced, some of their warehousing facilities socially distanced, their manufacturing facilities socially distanced and I think even though there might have been nominally, nominally an increase in demand for some of the things that they're making and because more people want to do outdoor activities because they've been allowed to do outdoor activities where they haven't been allowed to do indoor activities um, it's been hard for them to keep up with demand, whether they've been building canoes, whether they've been making rucksacks, whether they've been making other things that people use outdoors. And so I think there's been a shortage of some things that you'd normally easily be able to get hold of, um, both online and in, and in retail stores. So um, yeah, it's, it's had all sorts of impacts that are still you know, working their way through. Um, those are just some of the things that I know about anecdotally. I haven't seen any cross industry analysis, but I know um, from speaking to quite a lot of people in different aspects of the outdoor industry, you know, whether it's equipment manufacturers, whether it's YouTubers, whether it's you know, professional instructors and people who run centers, there's been a lot of knock on effects and there will continue to be going forwards into 2021. Um, even just as a result of what happened in 2020, never mind what's uh, potentially going to come over this winter at the moment. As, as I record this, you know, numbers in the UK are going up, numbers in the US are going up, supposedly. Um, and um, won't get too much into, into the politics of some of these things. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't think we're out of the woods yet in terms of the potential impact um, or the factors which have so far impacted I think some of those will come back again and I think it's going to be a rough winter and hopefully by the spring things will start to be looking up again although I it's hard to it's hard to see a, a clear way through at this stage I still think that we will be um, living with Covid um, for quite a while yet because even if a you know it's not my area of specialism but it's just I used, you know, I used to work in business, in big business, um, before I moved completely over to, to teaching bushcraft. Um, things don't happen that quickly, even when you want them to. Think about the scale of the number of people that might need to be vaccinated and the amount of material that needs to be manufactured and then that to be distributed in a, in a um, controlled way. Um, it's going to take some time before we can go back to life as normal. Um, even if a vaccine was, you know, was okay today, it's going to be some time down the road. And, you know, we still have to protect people in the meantime um, until everyone um, that needs to be vaccinated has been vaccinated. And, and I, you know, it's not going to be like flicking a switch. Um, it's just, that's just practical. Um, you don't need to be an expert on vaccines or immuno immunology or anything to understand there's just a logistical problem there that's going to take some time to resolve even if there is a vaccine and um, so I think you know uh, in terms of my view is that I'm being quite conservative in terms of anything new or expansive in my business at the moment I'm just trying to keep a, a handle on what we've got already and manage the cost base and um, be, be quite flexible with our customers about what we can do for them should the rules change and the rules are changing from one week to the next at the moment luckily we're coming towards the end of our very short summer season we only really ran courses in august and august september and october but um you know whereas we'd normally be running stuff from late march um, but hopefully we can have a more normal year next year that's that's what i'm hoping for and certainly we've got the the dates on our website um that's a very long answer, but I think it's important. And if you've got any comments, um, you know, if you're in the industry and you've got a different viewpoint to that or that corroborates your thinking or you've got some more color to add to that, let us know in the comments below, whether you're on YouTube, on my blog, you can leave comments. It'd be interesting to hear um, what's going on with you. There was a second question from Steve. I think I recall from one of your videos, it may have been on the tree plant and ID, that you said you studied something like maths at uni. How did you go from studying that to living bushcraft and setting up a business? Um, I know Woodlaw played a big part, but I'm also listening to, to Ray Mears' biography 
at the minute and it had me wondering more about others office based to outside based living working transitions um well i've talked about this before so i'm not going to go into a huge amount um but fundamentally there's no there was no great secret um there's not there's no magic um a lot of people a lot of people are happy to change jobs within their industry they don't think about it too much particularly these days you know back a couple of generations ago when it was a job for life perhaps if you if you stayed with the same employer um people moving from one place to the other perhaps was frowned upon but these days and certainly in the last 20 to 30 years people moving from you know a, a you know a sales and marketing manager moving from one company to another company to another company or you know a um uh, someone who was, you know, is an IT expert moving from one place to another to another, you know, or somebody who is a mechanic moving, working from one garage to working to another garage. That's not unusual. And in some ways, it's not any different if you move to doing a different job. Um, I think what people struggle with, and maybe why people keep asking me this, is how do you manage the financial transition? And that's there's no secret that's just savings you know have some savings have some buffer um and then when you make a you make a jump to something else maybe you have to retrain maybe you have to take time out to do a vocational qualification maybe, you know and i'm not just talking about bushcraft here it's just practical life skills it's like how do you make a jump from one career to another well you can start doing something as a side gig you know so even if you've got a full-time job most people's full-time job is not more than 40 or 50 hours a week. And I know some people have got commutes and whatnot, but you know, there's 160 odd hours in a week. Is that right? Yeah, 24 times seven. Yeah, yeah, there's 160 odd hours in a week. Um, yes, I did do maths at university. Um, <laughs> you're only using like a quarter of that for your job. So you, you could do two jobs. You could literally do two jobs and still have enough time to sleep and eat. Like you, you absolutely can. Um, now, whether or not that practically works in time with the time of day, but you can certainly spend time on developing skill sets, weekends, evenings, you know, you can read up on stuff in the evenings. You can go out and practice skills on a weekend. You can go and do courses on a weekend. You can do night school. You can do online learning. There's lots of ways that while you still have the job that you have, you can, you can start developing the skill set um, or at least a professional skill set that you need um, to, to move from one career to another. Um, are you going to be able to go in at the same pay level? Normally not. Um, I certainly took a massive pay cut when I moved over to working in bushcraft full time and working in bushcraft instruction. And yes, that was with Woodlaw. Now I'd had a long time passion for outdoor skills. I'd had a long time passion for nature and the woods ever since I was a kid. Yes, I did maths at university. Yes, I was a numerate graduate. Yes, I ended up with a reasonably good job at the end of that. And no, it wasn't something I wanted to do for the rest of my life, but it was a way that I could earn some money, put some money in the bank, get some good professional skills, become reasonably well socialized in the workplace, which actually a lot of graduates aren't, um, you know, become a functioning per member of society and the workplace. And I also, alongside that, continue to develop my outdoor skills, continue to develop my knowledge. And I started working part time with Woodlaw. Then I moved. I was offered a full time job, which is rare in the field. And so I took the opportunity, always thinking that if it didn't work out, I could go back. And I didn't go back and I didn't want to go back. And there are a number of reasons for that. And I've talked about them before. And so I won't I won't kind of go over old ground there. But fundamentally, it was just being logical, biding my time, working at my skill set and putting myself in a position where if opportunities came, I could take advantage of them and then continue to work. Now, the most difficult part was start starting my own business. Um, but that's not specific to bushcraft or outdoor instruction. It's just specific to starting businesses. Um, most people don't have any experience in running a business. Um, and I, while I had worked in other people's businesses, I didn't have experience of running my own business. And there's a big steep learning curve there, not least because you don't have all the money that you want to do certain things. You don't have um, a, a massive workforce. You might be the only person, um, maybe you and a partner or you and a friend or, or what have you. Um, and you've got to bootstrap. You've got to do things with very little money 
and you've got to eke out the money that you do have for as long as possible until you actually start generating some profit. And it takes much longer than you might expect. Um, you know, people talk about most businesses fail within three years and many of them do, but I would say that you need a lot more um, reserve than just three years because if anything goes wrong, like COVID, or you know, lots of other things that could go wrong in a business, you're not gonna survive. Even if you had a good idea, you had good um, working practice, you had good ethics, you had a great you know, working ethic, you work hard. Um, if you run out of money, um, you're stuffed. Um, and so be very, very careful about making commitments um, beyond your means and expect things to take longer than you expect them to do. So yeah, the hardest thing I've done um, professionally is start a business and make that business successful. Um, and it continues to be a challenge. And you know, if you're used to having a job um, where you can pretty much forget about it, and I know some people take their job home with them, and I know some people are workaholics, and I know some people find it hard to switch off, it's nothing compared to having your own business where the buck stops with you. Nobody else is ultimately responsibility for the success or the failure of that business other than you. Um, customers contact you at all times of the day, the weekends, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's hard work. So you've got to really love it. And so this isn't a business podcast, um, but to, to answer your question, I would caution very much against jumping into something with rose tinted spectacles. So if you, you know, if you've got a good, well-paid job and you like doing outdoor things, you like doing outdoor activities and you think, oh, maybe I'd like to do that for a living, really think hard about how you can make it work as a living and be very realistic about that. Um, outdoor instructors don't get paid very much. Whether, and that's not just about bushcraft, that's whether you're um, a canoe instructor, a climbing instructor, etc., etc. Just the level of pay is not that high. So you have to really love what you do. You have to love being outside. You have to enjoy sharing your skills and enabling other people to, to do things that they couldn't otherwise do. That has to be your primary motivation for doing it. Um, whether you're working for somebody else or whether you start your own business, but certainly I've had so many people over the years who have a fantastic time on a bushcraft course or a, or a wilderness expedition and say, oh, you must love your job, this must be amazing. Yeah, but it's hard work and we don't have, we, we do absolutely enjoy what we do, but equally the experience on the other side of the fence is very different to when you're responsible for everyone, you're responsible for the logistics, you're responsible for the financial state of the company, etc, etc, etc. It's a lot of load on your shoulders. And I'm not running wilderness trips, you know, 52 weeks a year. Um, I'm not running bushcraft courses 52 weeks of the year. There's all the usual business admin, you know, managing people, recruiting, training, um, dealing with providers, suppliers, all of that sort of stuff. And you kind of have to like that grind and you have to like that tussle um, to make it worthwhile. So um, yes, I'm glad I made the transition. Was it complex to make the transition? No. Was it complex to make it work? Yes, um, is, <laughs> is the short answer to that. Um, hopefully that wasn't too generalized an answer for you, Steve. Um, but I have talked about some of the more specific things in the past. And then um, the last question here, is, and I didn't mean to make this whole episode about uh, Steve, uh, but he had a number of good questions here. And one of them was very relevant to what's been going on since the last Ask Paul Kirtley's. And the next part is, I know a fair portion of bushcraft is practice and experience. However, another large part is remembering, and mine isn't the sponge it used to be. The characteristics of X is A, B, and C. It can be used for P and Q, and it is edible um, if you, or edible if you do this and that to it, um, or this part's edible, this part's poisonous. Excuse me, and there is mountains of information to potentially remember. Do you have any memory aids, tricks, advice that that help you with remembering that may help others? Um, well, 
I seem to have quite a good memory anyway. Um, I don't think I've got an exceptional memory. I wouldn't want to enter a memory competition, you know, the, these memorization competitions. Um, I, I think I've, I've probably said this before somewhere, um, possibly on an Asper Kirtley, but if I haven't, then here goes. A friend of mine's a psychologist and I asked him, because I'm not very good at remembering jokes. I remember some, but I'm not very good at remembering them. I'll often remember the punchline when somebody starts telling a joke, but if, if you said, oh, tell me 10 jokes, I'd probably struggle. Um, and it's not that I don't have a sense of humor, it's just that I'm not, I'm not the guy who starts telling the jokes around the campfire, you know, that, that's not me. Although I do enjoy a good joke and I do try and remember some, I'm just not very, I don't seem to be very good at remembering them. So I, I, I had a, uh, you know opportunity to ask my friend who's a psychologist who kind of has some understanding of the brain, um, and I said, why is it that some people are really good at remembering jokes and other people aren't? And he just said, it's because they're more interested than you. And I think a lot of memory comes down to interest. Like if you're really into a subject, you'll remember, this, you're, you, you, just, you just, you soak it up. Um, that's part of it. And so that's not to say that if you're finding it hard to remember things, you're not interested, but I think it goes a long way. If you can remember things, um, because you're really into it. Um, but equally, a lot of what we're talking about is practical. You know, when we're talking, even, you know, even when we're talking about tree and plant identification, um, and you said you're on the tree and plant ID course, but you can't just sit and watch a bunch of videos and presentations and read notes and then be able to go out into the field and be able to identify everything. You actually need to go and get hands-on experience. You need that tactile experience and you need, to, you need it to be iterative. And I think that's, I think these days, and, I, and I, this isn't necessarily aimed at you, but just as a general answer to the question, um, I think these days people expect a lot um, without a lot of effort. And, how do I remember so much about trees and plants and their uses? Um, first off, I'm really interested. Second is that I've been interested for a long time and I've gone back over and over and over um, just the knowledge base. And then I've also gone out into the field and I have identified things and I've iterated back to guidebooks, I've iterated back to bushcraft books and then I've gone back out and I've iterated again. Um, and have I got some things wrong? Yes. And have I got some, lots of things right? Yes. And then you keep improving, you keep improving. And using things for the practical use will imprint on your brain the practical uses. If you just try and learn everything academically, you won't remember all the uses of things. You have to actually go and do them. Um, and just remembering what the uses are won't actually tell you how to do those things either. You know, it's all well and good knowing, you know, a list of 20 uses for a birch tree, but can you do all of those things? And if you have done all of those things, you will remember them. So a lot of it's just about get, go, getting out and getting your hands dirty. Once you've got the basic knowledge that you can do something, go out and try it, go out and practice it, come back, make notes, make a diary, journal your experiences. Um, try and share that knowledge with other people as long as it's solid knowledge. And I have to say, teaching for many, many years has also helped consolidate my knowledge. If you want to get really good at, at, at knowing your ins and outs of a subject is, is start teaching it to other people or at least write it down in a way that could be understood by somebody else. Um, that goes a long way to starting to really synthesize the information that you've got and make it your own. Um, and so that's super, super uh, useful as well. But fundamentally, it's a combination of the academic knowledge, going out and practicing things and, and doing things practically and then iterating back, making notes. Like I remember the first bushcraft course that I did, um, I went back some time after that course and I had lots of notes about tree uses and plant uses and medicinal plants and food plants and things. Half of that wasn't in my head, at least. And I could remember as looking at the plant, when I went back to my notes, it's like, oh yeah, they told us this about St. John's work, or they told us this about um, Rose Bay Willow Herb, or whatever it was, you know, lots of different plants. Um, or some plants. It seemed a lot at the time, but in retrospect, it wasn't a ton. But um, 
unless I'd written those things down, that knowledge would have been gone. And then I went back over it again. So that's just reviewing. So when you learn something, it's short term memory, write it down as well, review it later, but also in the meantime, then go out and practice, see if you can identify things, see when you identify it in the woods, can you recall what it was used for? If not, go back and look at your notes, so on and so forth. It takes time, it takes time. Um, I'm not going to answer all the questions I thought I was going to answer on this session. There's one other one that I'm going to hit now because it's, it's, it's um, very relevant. And then I'm going to, I'll, I'll hit the others in, because I've taken longer on those than I thought. Plus I had quite a long introduction. I'll hit the others in episode 82, which I'll get out fairly soon. Okay, so this is the last one for today. And this was a question that had both a lot of echoes in the comments below. Other people asked the same thing, perhaps without even seeing this or asked a very similar thing. And also there were comments directly in response to this question. And this is from Gareth and Zoe Wildcamps. And they said, yeah, bring them back, Paul. We all value your thoughts and info on Ask Paul Kirtley. They don't always need to be an hour long, always. <laughs> well, maybe this one will be. Just do them if you get a spare 20 minutes or so, or even do one video per question, etc. We've talked about this. Uh, so the question is, um, what do you think is the best way to promote the leave no trace ethos? We always try on our videos, but sometimes we feel we need a new method to really get into people's heads. We've been finding more and more litter in the outdoors and we can't help but get annoyed with it all. There must be a more effective way than just telling people to tidy up after themselves. Would love, your, would love to hear your thoughts, Gareth and Zoe Wildcamps. And I think this links in with what we talked about earlier. Certainly in the UK, I, I can't speak to other places around the world, but certainly in the UK this year, you've had a lot of people who have been looking to um, spend some time outdoors for a number of reasons. One is they can't go on holiday. Like a lot of people in the UK take holidays in Europe, particularly in the summer. People like to go to Spain and Italy and Portugal and, and many other parts of Europe, but particularly those places. And many of those holidays are relatively inexpensive. Greece as well, um, relatively inexpensive and they get good weather and they can have a nice time good food, sunshine, sea, sand, all of that sort of stuff, partying, you know, for the younger generation perhaps as well, um, which is great. You know, it's a, it's a nice release um, from their normal lives. You know, that's what holidays should be. That's what vacation should be, where you just, everything that you're normally concerned with is maybe out of your mind, whether it's work, relationships, you know, family, whatever. It's just, it's a really good kind of recharge time. And people haven't been able to do that this year, but people have been allowed to do things outdoors, where it's, whereas meeting up indoors has been difficult. Restaurants have been closed, pubs have been closed, music venues have been closed, um, gyms have been closed, leisure centers have been closed, but people have been able to go to the park in towns. People have been able to get outside into the countryside um, at least still to, to do some sort of activities, to walk the dog, go for a hike, what have you. But what we've seen a lot of is people going out and camping that wouldn't normally camp. So they've bought a cheap tent, a festival tent or what have you, um, or they're just going in their car and um, they're not even hiking and they're camping by the side of the road. They're pulling up somewhere scenic, you know, a scenic uh, viewpoint and they're camping. And um, even when I hiked up into the woods here today, um, where I parked my vehicle down the bottom, um, sort of hiking into this area, I've never noticed a sign there before which says no overnight camping, um, whereas there is one there uh, now. Um, I haven't been to this part of Scotland since last year. I've, I've been on this hike that I'm doing today before, um, but I haven't been up here since last year. Um, and I don't recall there being a sign down there saying no overnight camping. So that's clearly become an issue um, in many places. And there are people that aren't normally camping in some cases. And so I think the type of, to answer your question directly, Gareth and Zoe, the people who are consuming your content online and consuming my content online are probably already on side with, you know, 
being tidy uh, in, in the way that they can, leaving their fire safe if they're having a fire, not leaving cans, not leaving litter. Although there is, a, there is an element of uh, the bushcraft world which is starting to get bushcraft as a bad name by, you know, having fires close to trees, hacking trees, um, building shelters out of natural materials where the, the areas are too sensitive to do that. But that's a different, that's a different story. Let, let's try and discourage that. And I think we can, we can treat that directly via our channels. I think the challenge we've got are people who, they're not in the outdoors community in, in the sense they're not consuming YouTube videos about outdoor skills. They're not reading outdoors magazines. They're not part of the typical, um, you know, that they're not dyed in the wool hikers and campers or kayakers and canoeists and, you know, people who spent a lot of time outdoors and maybe are around other people who know how to operate when they were younger and they've learned themselves. You've got a bunch of people and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you've got a bunch of people heading out to the outdoors um, who have been confined indoors, who might be doing other things normally, who are now going out and camping. And I think it's those people that are largely responsible for the increase in, in littering, particularly when it's close to roads. Um, and, you know, we've seen it in North Wales, for example, you've seen tons of people parking up in beauty spots. You've seen tons of people going out for hikes on Snowdon. You've got people camping in laybys. It's the same in the Lake District. It's the same in other places. And they're leaving a lot of litter because they don't know what to do with it. And there's two things going on there. And I've said this definitely before and asked Paul Kirtley's, is that you've got people who, you know, as a society, when like 80% of people live in urban or suburban environments in developed world countries, whether we're talking about North America or UK and, and Europe, um, which means that most people live in a place where somebody comes and sweeps the streets, they empty the bins, they empty the bins from their house, they empty the bins from the bins in the street, they empty the bins and clean up in the parks. And most people are used to living, so, you know, people are constantly cleaning up after them. And that doesn't happen out, in, in, out in a bit more in the wild. In the countryside, yeah, okay, if you put rubbish in a, in a litter bin that's by a, a, a parking spot, somebody will come and collect that at some point. But, because that's why, that's why the bin's there. But generally, if you, if you just chuck stuff in a hedge, you chuck stuff in a lay-by, there isn't anybody that's going to do that and yet those people have been conditioned that that's fine because that's what they do all day every day they throw rubbish into or near a bin or in the street in a park and somebody cleans it up and so there's a lack of feedback loop there they don't understand the the consequences and they don't understand there's a con difference in context then you've got quite you've got you know fires but you see that in towns as well you see people making a mess of public parks with disposable barbecues they burn you know singe marks char marks in the grass with a disposable aluminium barbecue um people are just stupid sometimes they're just ignorant and you know and i know there's a difference between stupid and ignorant some people are stupid and you can't really fix that some people um just don't care um I'm not sure what you do about that either. And also some people are ignorant, and, and I mean that in the best sense of the world, word, is that they don't know what else to do. Um, and, and I understand it to an extent. It's like, it's so easy to get packaged food. You know, if you, even, even as a camper, like if you, you know, we just did some spay trips and you know, you've got tins of fish and things that we might be putting into a dinner. You know, tins of tuna are pretty stinky even if you wash them out a bit. And, and so unless you've got a decent garbage bag to put those things in that isn't gonna rip, you know, like a rubble sack rather than just a black bin bag, and you can transport it back out with you, it's like, what do you do with it? You don't want it in your rucksack with you. You don't want it in your camping bag with you. You need to think ahead. So, you know, it's, it's, it's thinking ahead, taking a rubbish home with you, and I don't think there's any excuse for, you know, if, you, if you've taken it there in a vehicle with you, you can take it home with you in a vehicle. Um, but I think the thing that people need to realise is that nobody's there to clean, af clean up after them and take some garbage sacks and pick it up. Um, and the problem that we've got is that 
none of the people that are doing those things are watching these videos they're not watching your videos they're not reading the outdoor magazines they're not reading the countryside code websites and so i think probably the only solution to it would be um to to have at the point of sale of a tent or piece of camping equipment maybe a little flyer that has some suggestions and i think you're right just saying clean up after you it's not it's not enough um for somebody that isn't experienced as you you need to tell them what to do so just say take some garbage bags with you take some good quality garbage bags with you um this is how to cr crush a can put them in here and um, take them home with you put them in your recycling um that would go a long way but i don't think there's i don't think there's any way of solving a problem when you you know some people let their dogs crap in you know in public parks and they don't clean it up they let them crap on the pavement they don't clean it up even though everyone knows that they shouldn't do that it's antisocial. there's dog poop bins everywhere some people just don't care or they can't be bothered to to deal with that and i don't think you're ever going to get through to those people um, in terms of littering and making a mess. Some people don't know what to do, but would do the right thing if they could. And I think the only way that you can get through to those if they're not kind of more um, outdoorsy people normally is when they go and buy the outdoor stuff, like the tents and what have you, even if they're cheap tents, is maybe just have a little flyer in there that says, if you're camping, this is how to tidy up after yourself. That would go a long way, I think. Um, wouldn't solve all the problems and it wouldn't stop some people not caring, but I think um, that would be part of it. I don't think you're going to solve the problem with your YouTube channel. I'm not gonna solve the problem with my YouTube channel or my blog, um, unfortunately. Um, and I think the other thing as well is if you see people littering, um, maybe say something, but the problem is you might end up with a confrontation there. I remember when I was a kid, my dad um, <laughs> told a couple of teenagers to pick, they'd thrown a McDonald's, I think it was McDonald's, but you know, they'd thrown a carton of drink down, you know, with a straw and a bag. And my dad says, well, you know, pick it up. And, you know, there's a bin over there these teenagers just turned around to my dad and told him to F off. Um, I'm not sure what you do with that. Um, you know, some people would say we need more police on the streets and giving kids a clip around their, e their ear, and that would be one solution. Um, it, it's a difficult one. Um, some people are just antisocial and don't care about the effect that they have on other people, but most people do care, and I think it's just a case of education. But I think once you have people outside of the normal outdoor community you've got to look at ways of of, of different ways of, of educating them um, you could even have a government funded you know like you know you used to get those evening um adverts about charlie says you know don't go off with strangers or you know don't fall asleep with cigarettes burning or you know get your gas fire checked, you know, those sort of public information type things. If it's becoming a significant problem and it continues to be a significant problem, I think there's a case for, um, you know, government funding that, got, you know, some of the funding that goes towards some of the national parks, perhaps if those national parks are having a particular problem with littering, maybe some of that budget or some extra budget goes towards putting some adverts up in between um, shows that are watched by the demographics of the people that are likely to be making the mess in the first place and putting some adverts there for them perhaps um, I'm just talking off the top of my head here but um, you've got to reach the people that are causing the problem um, rather than reaching the people that already know what the solution is is the short answer anyway I have talked way too long um, and as per usual I haven't really thought about um, specific answers to some of these questions and I think that's one of the things you get me thinking on the spot um, but it's good to be back I will tighten these up as we go forwards um, I will stick to a couple of questions per episode uh, that will make it easier for me to produce them it will make it easy for you to consume them but it's kind of been quite nice to have a bit of a, an open-ended session the first time a couple of very relevant questions there that are very timely in the in the period that we're living appreciate that i appreciate there's hundreds more questions there underneath that video from uh, a week or two ago and um, i will 
continue to, to pull out some questions from that and answer them going forwards. And I will also get the other methods back up and running, the voicemails, etc. I think it's really nice to hear from people as well, um, particularly for those who are listening on the audio, um, people to leave a voicemail, and I will talk about how to do all of that in the forthcoming episodes. But thank you again for your interest. Thank you for supporting this uh, show. Thank you for being positive about having this back again. Thank you for your interest in what I have to say. Let me know in your comments below what you think about any of the things I've talked about today. And I look forward to seeing you in another or, or speaking to you in another episode of Ask Paul Kirtley before too long. Take care and enjoy the music. I know some of you have been missing it. Mm -hmm.